Well, uh, this final section here as we wrap up for the day is an opportunity for you to ask questions of not only Dr. Butterfield, uh, but the other speakers who have spoken today, and I'll introduce them to you briefly. Uh, just uh, we'll pass around the microphone, say who you would like to address your question to, and they will step forward and share uh, their wisdom. I guess you'll be the only oh, yes, one going forward. All right, uh, we're missing one of them, but that's okay. We'll, we'll figure that out. So Dr. Scipione, you've met, uh, and uh, he spoke uh, quite capably last night. Uh, I do have one of his books. There's a unique thing about this book. It's called The Sword and Shovel, uh, and The Sword and Shovel really takes a look at what's at stake as our culture tries to redefine what the family is. Well, you can find this book on Amazon for about $200. <laughs> Not bad. Uh, it's out of print, but the seminary has copies for $17. So I, you want to buy it online for 200 go ahead and do it. But this is another one of these resources that you want in your library for so many different reasons that I won't take your time to uh, reveal today. Uh, his uh, wonderful partner uh, who's not here, oh, here she comes right now, Eileen Scipione as she's heading up. Uh, Eileen is a, a NAC certified counselor. Uh, she works with us at the Biblical Counseling Institute and uh, just a gifted uh, disciple of the Bible. Also, uh, you may not have met yet, uh, Yasko Kanamori, again, uh, from the Biblical Counseling Institute. She also is a NAC certified counselor. And then uh, the Reverend Martin Blocky, uh, who's my associate pastor, and uh, he's a lot taller than I am. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he also does some work with us at the Counseling Institute. So we could uh, spend a whole bunch of time here, but we won't because it's so beautiful. I know you want to go home and cut your grass uh, <laughs> since it's growing. But uh, let's, uh, if you have some questions, please raise your hands and let us know who you want to talk to. And Chris has a question right away. Are you Chris? I had a question for Dr. Butterfield. You had mentioned that uh, when you wrote your book, you had anticipated it being read by a few select friends and family, and it seems the Lord has really blossomed that. Can you speak a little bit to the type of groups and organizations that you're now getting the opportunity to speak in front of us so that we might be able to pray for you and oh, know the type that. of opportunities that you're getting that maybe the rest of us don't quite have that type of audience? Well, and I pray that you will have that audience. <laughs> I, have, I have a plan for you, in fact. <laughs> I have to have a filter for the, the speaking engagements, and, my, and my, my primary objective is to help build the Reformed Church. And so I, I uh, to the degree that I'm able to, I, I almost always say yes to Reformed Churches that are seeking to do evangelistic outreach ministry to their, um, their communities in the gay and lesbian communities uh, in their in their midst, and also on college campuses. And so to that end, I also have been working with campus ministries that have uh, Reformed churches close at hand. And maybe you're wondering why I keep saying Reformed churches. You know, maybe that seems, you know, for somebody who's been in some ways anti-label, why I am emphasizing this in such a way. I believe that the Reformed doctrine has the only answer right now to the question of, uh, of, of, of why do I feel like I was born this way? I do. And, um, and I feel like we have a, a window here of opportunity. And I'm, I do, I have a plan for you, so, uh, so you're in that. But I, I can't speak as much as I um, am invited to speak because my primary job is as a wife and a mother, and I homeschool my children, and I, that's just that. So I, I think that God will, um, will help organize you know, some, of my, um, some of my no's um, in, in, in that way. But I'm also writing. I'm writing a, another book on Christian hospitality because that is the ground zero of the Christian life. I, my, um, my conversion... Uh, happened in the context of, of, of Ken and Floyd Smith's Christian hospitality. 
and um, I have a passion and a great gratitude for that. Um, and so I'm writing about that. I'm also doing some writing on biblical sexuality because I feel like that's another subject that we, we need to be uh, better equipped um, to, 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 um, to articulate. Uh, because the best defense against the, um, the um, attacks on marriage is a defense uh, for the cosmology and the ontology of God's creation ordinances and the role that each of us plays in that, married or not, and the power of church membership in the context of that. Um, so I appreciate your prayers, um, you know, for, for, for me, but, but I also appreciate the ministry that I'm hoping that you will be doing. So if, if the Lord continues to give me a microphone and an audience, um, I will... I will obey as best as I can, but I am um, just so glad that we are in this together. And so I, I uh, always pray that your ministries will, uh, will increase uh, to, that, to that end. Did I answer your question? Yes. Um, this is a question for Dr. Butterfield and Dr. Scipioni, both. Um, despite having my degree in conflict resolution, I might be uh, trying to raise a point of conflict, if, or maybe a bit of difference. <laughs> um, um, Rosario, you in your book talk about Jay, and I, I hope this question isn't, I'm not just trying to pick a point, but um, I think it's a, um, it's a question that I thought about. I don't have any transgender, transsexual friends that I'm talking with. Um, these days, but I know that you refer to Jay um, in the present as she, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jay is a biologically male, male. Um, uh, taking chemicals. Um, chemically castrated. Chemically castrated, you said. Um, so I, I wonder if you can give some reasons as to why you use the, the female pronoun, and I haven't talked with Dr. Scipioni, I, uh, <laughs> uh, but I just wonder... Um, from one, one of your students, at least, I think you might take the, the point that if someone is biologically male, then you would use the, um, the male pronoun. And I'm just interested on that because, I mean, if I were talking to somebody, I imagine that could be an area of um, sort of the acceptance versus approval, maybe, mm -hmm. um, and just how, um, I mean, is this a big issue? Am I yeah. picking yeah. over something yeah. that's a, yeah. a minor thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's the question of where do you draw the line between acceptance and approval. So I would say that to accept people where they are means um, meeting them where they are. So that's why I use the, the pronoun that Jay uh, has embraced. My response to that is, um, it depends where I am, as well as the person. If the person comes in to me for counseling, <clears throat> I will say to them as kindly as I can to anybody uh, who's not transgendered, um, you are who God has made you, and my job is to try to get you there. I can't drag you there, I can't force you there, but God knows who you are. And since he created you, I don't think we would differ on that. It'd be just tactically how I just, if I meet somebody on the street that's transgendered, I will use that person's name that they have. Um, another context, if somebody comes in and says, I'm Jane Doe, and I have multiple personality disorder, and <clears throat> they say, I'm now Sally. I said, no, you're Jane Doe, and I'm going to address you as Jane Doe because there's really only one of you. And that's who you are as God's made you. But I'm not going to force somebody. I mean, I don't go up to a pagan on the street and say, you're the image bearer of God and start acting like it. <clears throat> I mean, I do, but it's a little. <clears throat> I, lead up, I lead up to it, okay? I, I, try, to, I try to get into it easily. But anyway, hopefully it helps. the country. I've had a number of people call me looking 
I can, for new set account, you know, counselors. And if is that on the school website? Um, uh, I, I happen to know uh, someone in New York, but I mean, it's always good to be able to refer people close to home. Um, there is a NANC website. Um, <clears throat> The person is only as good as who they are. And if you don't know everybody personally, um, I can recommend you go to the NANC website. They go through a vetting process. NANC is National Association of Neuthetic Counselors. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I will also call, uh, for example, someone that's not, say, Rich Gans, just to <coughs> we all know. If, any, if he's anywhere near Canada, I'll say go contact Rich and find rich and work your way down to a pastor or somebody else in the area. So you start with a list like that of someone that's certified, but there are people I know and respect that are not yet certified, but I would send people there. And so because, let me just give a quick summary. We believe that counseling as professionally viewed now is discipleship, that discipleship's done in the church so if a pastor doesn't have formal training, uh, either he is a good pastor or he's not, and he may not have formal training, but if he knows the scriptures, loves them. Ken Smith is not, you know, he's not NANC certified. And uh, what can you say? <laughs> As I try to say to all my friends in that business, I go, guess what? The church got along for 2,000 years without us. So, you know, we're parachurch. You know, you want me to work for a parachurch organization? The church is where it's at. I love doing that to my Baptist brethren. I'm a Presbyterian. I believe in the local church. That's where the action's at. <clears throat> and uh, with church discipline, a uh, center can't do church discipline. So the whole uh, broad scope of God's gifts are at the church. And so hopefully we can, uh, what we're trying to do at the seminary is to prepare people for the problems they'll face to do a good job with or without certification. But that would be the general way I would do. And if I don't know anyone, then I'll say, call pastor so-and-so. He's in the general area. He may know somebody, and I would go that approach. Anyone else? Or we'll look right back. Yeah. Uh, this is for Dr. Butterfield. Uh, this is just um, on a question somebody else asked. You talk about adhering to the Reformed doctrine. Mm -hmm. And you said because it best answers the question, why do I feel I was born this way? Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could expound on that a little. Sure, when somebody absolutely. asks you that, what do you say? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, in, 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 a, in a Reformed and covenantal understanding of, um, of Christianity, we would not say that Christians are simply people who believe in Jesus. Nor would we encourage someone to recommit his or her life to Christ if you're struggling with sin. Um, we would, I hope, right? I'm saying we as though we, you know, we, we all need to get up to speed on this, right? But the idea is that we would see hand on hand, heart on heart, Bible on experience, experience on Bible, discipleship as, a, as a, a way to open a person, to expose a person to the fluency of the Holy Spirit, to, I'm sorry, to the fluency of the Bible, to enlighten and um, sort of open the you know, the, the sensibilities to what the calling of the Holy Spirit might, might, might look like, might experientially be. And we would also want a person to see that every opportunity, including this struggle with besetting sin, because that's, that's what the struggle of homosexuality is, it's a struggle with besetting sin. Every opportunity is an opportunity to glorify God if we struggle in God's way. All right. I would also, I'm also emphasizing the Reformed faith because our churches, um, our churches embrace of the regulative principle of worship 
and high value for church membership sets people up to do battle with their sin in a helpful and decent way. When someone comes to me and says, Rosaria, I can't change. Okay. You know, I don't say, and, and, and you, know, you wouldn't say, well, you know, come on, just get with it, right? Just do it. You know, didn't the Nike ad do well with that? Just, you know, resolve, right? We, we wouldn't do that. Um, but, but we might say, um, well, no, you, you can't right now, just like I can't run a marathon right now. But with spiritual grit and the power of the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, the support of your local church, I know you can. I don't think you can. I know it. But in the meantime, I'll hold your ankles. Right? This is scary. Who wants to do this alone? The, 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 the perfect storm of uh, sexual sin and shame and isolation have created these huge pockets of people who are terrified to get the very counseling that they need and the very discipleship that they need. Um, but easy believism won't get you there. Um, a a willy-nilly understanding of what worship is won't get you there. And see, look at me. You know, it's, it's, it's not just my gay and lesbian friends I offend. Some of you may be offended by that. Um, a, a lack of church membership, a belief that it's you and Jesus and that's going to work just fine, that won't get you there. So it's for those reasons that I believe. You know, I also read in the scriptures that God says he will use the weak and the foolish in these times. And so here we are, right? <laughs> you know, we're small. Um, but you know the other the other issue that is that is important at least in my counseling is the doctrine of election. Because if God chose you from before the foundations of the world, you see the question isn't whether you feel gay or not. The question isn't whether you struggle with homoerotic desire. That's not the question. The question who is Jesus and how do I get to him? And we need to change the question. Because the old questions are demeaning and defeating and ultimately easy to dispense with. But God forbid we dispense with the question, who is Jesus? You know, I would also say that I spend a lot of time talking to people who feel and I believe have been betrayed by the evangelical church. They have been. It's real. But you know what? They have not been betrayed by Jesus. And so we need a doctrine and a theology that gets our special programs and our false understandings of the power of your will to pull yourself up from your bootstraps out of the paradigm, because that is not a doctrine that is helping anybody. So as always, when I speak, I probably give you, <laughs> leave you with more questions than answers. But you know, I'm one woman, busy, <laughs> a lot to do, and so um, this is how I have filtered um, through my understanding of the call that God's put on, on, on my life. Does that answer your question?